Serge, in a recent presentation, you revealed the factor of the true nature of the mind and, in fact, that the mind exists outside of the body. I, I mean, there's scientists that talk about the brain, etc., and we, we say that the brain is the, the center of the mind, but, in fact, you're positing that the mind exists outside of the body and I'd like you to talk a bit about that, but I really got the sense of that in that when you feel like there's, especially in states of anxiety, you can feel like there's a vice on your head, like that there's a, a pressure, and it is actually external. It does feel external. So that's like a physical experience of the mind being outside the body, but I'd like you to, to talk to us about how the mind exists outside of the body and what the nature of the mind actually is. The grassroots of understanding the mind is the factor of um, being a vehicle of expression and not, not a source of intelligence or a source of uh, uh, even life. We, we are not a source of life. We are given life and we are vehicles of expression. So you, you cannot have, you, you don't, your mind is not within you. Your mind is something, what we call a mind is what we access. And we have to learn what the, the uh, meaning of emphasis and focus, concentration and uh, purpose mean. And they align our vehicle of expression, which is our physical body, um, or any body, a spirit, a soul, these are all bodies. So they align to what is accessible. And in that accessed um, um, intelligence, we get informed. And that information is what we call intelligence. And it's what we refer to uh, by way of access, accessing a mind, but it's actually not inside us. It's, it's a very, very simple sci science that makes sense to the whole. But there will be those who are very proud of their intelligence, very proud of their, let's say, ach academic achievements or their positions in life whereby they will need to, will want to be identified by what they know and what they can recall and what they've achieved, as I said before. But the truth is we're accessing, uh, we're ac even recall, even memory is an access. And so if we can access recall, we're accessing information, it's no different, but that's not within us. It, it comes through us and it makes it look like it's coming from us, but it's coming through us. And it's a very easy process. And eventually, when we discover that our mind is not inside us, and that what's inside us is really just the receptiveness of experience, in other words, how life is involved, in being involved in life and how it registers, but that that can be also um, transmuted or elevated or, or ingrained, then we will understand that our mind is actually not, not inside us, but it's something that we, we access. Now, I'm sure you're going to go into the element of what I have referred to as being a crust, you know, a, a surrounding layer around us, which a lot of people call aura, but I prefer to call it a crust. And we're supposed to be eventually crust-free, so auric, aura-free or auric-free, um, so we can have a different uh, field of energy around us, which is called atma, which is A-T-M-A, -A, different to an aura. But to, the, the crust is simply formed by that which you rely on consistently. So if you're accessing a certain level of responsiveness or reaction, usually a reaction, then what you're accessing becomes your go-to access. That go-to access regularly um, practiced or regularly accessed forms that crust. But it means that you become very, very predictable, very um, habitual, uh, very addictive to, to a certain nature that you have surrounded yourself by, but that surrounding is the mind. It's, in other words, it's the thick layer of the crust that you have created yourself. So you're encrusted. You're Correct. crusty. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> and that's from sourcing a form of intelligence that you use as your security? It can be, it, yeah, it is. It's a go-to, it's secure, it's uh, identifiable, you know who you are. It sometimes it's safe. It, it's safe. It sometimes it causes, uh, well, it arouses uh, what we call confidence, which is really just a lack of presence. You know, it's a substitute for lack of presence. So we have confidence because we can go to something that we can access immediately and therefore we can deliver. 
It sounds good at dinner parties. It sounds good when you're giving a speech. It sounds good when somebody asks you something, you know, in the street or, or wherever it is. But the idea is to be completely transparent and not have a crust so that you're there to respond to what is required rather than go to the suite of collectives that you have made and, and rely on to deliver each and every time. Because you see this in people in conversations, you see the moment that they resource their sta- staples, that the moment they, they resource their safe point of conversation or co- topic of conversation and then derive the false confidence from that ease in which that they can traverse the particularities of that subject matter. But the tone changes, the vibration changes, the, you feel like you're, you know, like in somebody's, basically their secure quarters of, of how they're going to deliver that conversation and control the gameplay of that interaction. But when I sit in front of you, for instance, and we do absolutely no preparation coming into these interviews, I have to be in the obedience of being completely unknowing of what's going to happen and allowing that uh, transparency to allow me to access then something that I don't know where it's coming from and the beauty of that and in that there's no individuality because I can't resource stuff that's safe on the shelf. I have to allow myself to resource something that's greater than that crusted delineation, so to speak. That's what you're talking about, about a crustless life. That's correct. And perhaps you can say more in this episode about that because when I first met you, you were very usual, typical, I should say, typical, constructed, academic, that you had your go-tos and you had your, you know, your well-rehearsed syntax that you could regurgitate it at the drop of a hat. And these days you become very well disciplined in that what you call the unknowing state, but really it's just just a state of presence that allows you to be responsive to whatever is there. And the beauty of that is it's humble because if you ask something that you don't know, because your presence is already holding you and it's the true meaning of confidence, you, you can easily say, I don't know. You don't have to come up with something, but... Because you are in that state and you're not identified by what you're supposed to know or what you think you know, you usually come up with a lot of great responses simply because you are in that openness to be accessible to what is available rather than enclosing yourself to what has been gathered as your go-tos in terms of what you um, source as information. And then there's a great, much greater freedom of expression. That's correct. So how, how do you feel these days? Because you've got, a, you've got a, what we would call a great mind, but now you know it's not a great mind. You simply are now much more responsive to accessing what is available to you. So from being a great mind to now knowing that you don't have a great mind, but you have access to great minds, how does that feel to you? It, it, it's Is that the a, first time I've asked you? I'm interviewing you. <laughs> I know, it's great. <laughs> uh, there's there's a, a true beauty in feeling that you're in the wonderment of not knowing what's going to happen next, which is absolutely gorgeous, and, and in that you don't have any ownership over, over your knowledge because you realise that you're part of a much more expansive intimacy with the universe and you're not just this this shape that makes up the vehicle uh, that has the mind and the constructions and and all the knowledge that it's accumulated that actually your body can be at one with a much greater intelligence and that's an intelligence that's universal and therefore is not yours it's not something that you can own and it's something that you know is a vibration that speaks to everybody because it's a truer quality of expression, because you can feel that when you're speaking, you're speaking to a vibration that is equal in another by virtue of their universality, whether they're experiencing it or not. So are you saying that you've gone from the confidence of academic certainty and reassurance to the unknowingness of going into something completely unprepared but not feeling any form of tension or insecurity. That's exactly right. 
it's 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 a very beautiful thing and in fact this morning coming here was the first time that I haven't been in the anxiousness of running late which was my go-to stimulation of being in anxiety because that gave me some form of delineation that gave me some form of reductionism that I was in the anxiousness and panic of being late I didn't I didn't have that coming here this morning because I wasn't putting myself under a paradigm or a pressure that I needed to have my go-to resources. It sounds funny to say that a go-to resource is anxiousness, but in fact when that is what you delineate, you know, if that's what your image of yourself is and that's part of your craft, then you have to be in an anxiousness to recognize yourself. And that's part of the entrapment of the craft and your go-to securities. They're not, they're not forms of security, they're forms of imprisonment. Yeah, so, the, so I'm asking you to further that. Uh, the once upon a time confidence that you had with your mind, mindset or intelligence, is that the same confidence you have today? Or are you, uh, and I'm not leading this, do you still have that level of confidence? Or is there something else that has taken its place? There is definitely something else that's taken its place. And in fact, what it has done, it is shown the entrapment of that security. And in fact, that, that that form of security of accessing things from reasoning, having everything well thought out, the intelligent um, example, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all, all of those forms of deriving confidence, it, it actually makes you static. It traps you into time because whatever's in front of you, you have to try to mould it to fit with a paradigm that you have pre-prepared through your education. And then so you try to, you have to apply that model to what's in front of you and therefore you can't read the exactness and the nuances of the energetic communication that's in, actually in front of you. So that form of intelligence is actually a, uh, an anti-intelligence because it makes you less responsive and less able to respond in the settlement and the, the depth that you can. Yeah, and just to clarify, it's not that what we learn to apply in life is here not in question. The subject matter is here, is here about having a level of open responsiveness that is not delineated in any way, shape or form. In other words, it's not encapsulated. It's open, it's a truly open forum that gives you the confidence by being open and totally unprepared. But the preparedness is really your openness. So there isn't anything that, that has been accumulated to be delivered because that would be then controlling the narrative and controlling the subject and controlling where, where something is going to go, predictably or not. But about the, the security itself, the confidence, the, the quality of presence itself is coming from the fact that you are open and that you're humble about being in the openness with no preparedness other than the openness itself. Over to you. Exactly right. And the, the thing about that is that when, because like the tools I'm talking about, it's not that the education is the, pro, is the problem. Like I can learn about a lot of things. It's the, it's the using that as a form of security to make it look like I've got whatever's in front of me in hand. Because using, using that is a, as a form of control to make myself look intelligent in a certain situation or circumstance that that then brings a fixed point of understanding which is from my education, which is from the past, which is from time and tries to basically, you know, embedded in the situation that I'm in, then that, that also is a layer of judgment on any one situation. Like I have, to, I have to assess it and I have to make it fit with my, the tools that are my go-tos. And so I have to judge it to be this or that so that I can apply those tools. But when I'm free from having to rely on that, there's a communication that takes place whereby truth isn't fixed. It's, it's always absolute, but it's not fixed. And that's a very interesting experience because I, I've had experiences where something that I am impulsed to say to somebody, they might be in the, a very similar circumstance to somebody else. But the words that I use and what I'm impulsed to say to that person will be very different than the next person. 
based on so many different variables in that universality of communication that it, that is going to unlock that person if I use that word like I I use the word you know to someone I said the other day you you don't have to feel conceited because you can read energy just giving them permission to to not to realize that it's okay for them to have the level of awareness that they have even if somebody else gets triggered by that and the, that word conceded for them unlocks something but I didn't come up with that that was by virtue of me feeling what was there for that person but if I'm going to old tools then I won't have that access of communication and the particularities required in that circumstance that's that's the freedom of not being fixed and that feeling that you're talking about that you access can only come from your uh, openness because you can also become quite rigid in the field of what you will feel and not feel and therefore you will also be much more in the lockdown of what is accessed rather than just being completely open to feel what is actually there received and called out by the person to feel to be in response to and then that makes you a much better person to engage in terms of truly confirming that person in what they are actually saying rather than overriding them with a structure that you are relying to bring you confidence and make you look good which is actually not helping anybody at all it really it means it's all about you walking away feeling that you have delivered something because you have fulfilled yourself rather than, than assisting the person who is in that moment requiring something that really just opens them up to greater confirmations of what they already know and so we've, we've, what we've done is we've created a society where it's all about the control of what is exchanged so that we both walk away feeling good about each other or one feels the winner and one feels the loser if it's an adversarial situation. Uh, uh, as opposed to having a society where we are advancing each other by virtue of the confirmation, the exchange of confirmation and appreciation that we can access. And that can only be uh, uh, un understood and reattained by allowing ourselves to have space, in other words, the openness to communicate with each other and be responsive to each other in that manner. But to get to that, we need to understand we don't have a mind. And by your earlier definition, um, you made a very ev uh, evidence-based that we can't possibly have a mind because at what point do you do you control such that you have it all together if your mind was inside you then you could self-master life very easily but there are very few self-mastered people and that's because self-mastery has nothing to do with mastering self it's all about letting go of the self so that you are the an open vehicle of expression for what is there to be accessed which proves there is no such thing as a mind inside us blew my mind <laughs> That's huge. That's huge. So th th there's, you can't self-master life, but people try, and, and that's what we're talking about. It can look like somebody has all their go-tos and their logic, but in fact they're just accessing an intelligence that is from the outside of them that they've been told by society is safe. And this is where... The, the education and science kind of conditions us to say this version of intelligence is is the one that when you draw on this you will be deemed uh, by the status quo as being of the intelligence of the day which is a very dangerous place for us to access our intelligence from because as we've seen there's no logic actually involved in that like even in even in the temporal version of logic, like we can see that with evidence-based science, even though, you know, the emperor has no clothes in that situation, we, we know that, that um, can randomized, randomized controlled trials don't actually, you know, they're often sponsored, they're often corrupted. This is now common knowledge. This isn't anything new. And they can't replicate the results of their studies 13 years past the date that they did them, etc. We, we know this now, but if you wear the badge of science, you're, you're accessing a form of intelligence or that is deemed to be respectable in today's age. But that's a dangerous 
state to be, be accessing that level of intelligence as our intelligence when we consider how unreasonable it is, really. Well, I wouldn't call it dangerous, but it's certainly harming. It's, it's devastating of a society and the quality of a species when you are um, demonstrating that by virtue of control, you, you advance. You don't advance by control. Control is a, is, a, is, is a restriction. It will always be a restriction. And there's nothing but a restriction as a result of control. What we should be doing is advancing everybody by, uh, by allowing them to, the space to access what they can access, which is their essence. But let's go back to this mind thing, because if there was such a mind, if there was an academic avenue or an intelligence um, par, uh, a journey of accumulating intelligence why do so many smart people take their lives why are so many smart so-called smart people or um, you know accredited smart people recognized smart people not so good in many areas of their life they're not so stable in many areas of their life so then what is intelligence if it can't complete us is it, uh, complete us in life am i supposed to be only an expert in, say, engineering, and then outside of that, I can't be good at relationships or raising children or knowing how to do this or that? Am I really only allowed to be under the current model identified as being super smart because I have nailed down one aspect of life and become its complete dominance, and therefore I'm astute and shrewd in its expression and, and understanding? but in other areas I'm not. So then what is exactly intelligence when we can't be broad-minded, when we can't be uh, broad, in broad in our understanding and broad in our quality of actual presence? So it proves that our mind is actually not inside us because if it was, we would have had it, got it by now. Thousands and thousands of years, tens of thousands of years of being on the planet, we should have mastered something by now that allows us to not be so in disarray, mm. confusion, or in, 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 in the state of ill mental health. So it just proves that what we are doing is not, un, not being taught, we're not being schooled to know how to access what a mind truly is. A mind, like a consciousness, is outside of us, and we are vehicles of expression. And when we start to understand that, we can get into that equanimity that allows us to hold steady a flow that is superhuman and beautiful and yet it's no not, no more than ordinary for the person who is allowing themselves to be in that state of in that state of being i've heard you refer to that before as whole body mindedness can you talk about the difference between existing from a crust based intelligence and whole body mindedness whole body mindedness is is simply that you are moving in a way where your bo whole body is respected. The emphasis of being is entirely one and one whole. So there's the whole. Whole body mindedness means that your whole body is, is understood to be equal in all its parts and therefore respected, lived, appreciated and confirmed in all, in all as one through life as opposed to holding emphasis on, the, on a part of us, let's say the brain, that is only, re only registering receptivity through the nervous system as a result of the nervous system. So once we get into letting go of that, we can still use that aspect of understanding life through receptivity based on the nervous system and in, in, the, in the interactions. But once you give that its correct portion rather than holding it as the all, and therefore your emphasis is a much more whole or wholeness, then you let go of that limitation and become much more whole body minded in your understanding of yourself and of others and of the, um, the real life that you live in. And that knocks out the compartmentalization of, of only being intelligent in one area of your life. If, if there's a whole body mindedness, then, then your intelligence has to correspond with whether it is harmonious to the whole or not. And therefore, the imbalance doesn't take place. That's the equanimity you're talking about. But it just occurred to me when you we were talking about the fact that the brain is a receptor and is connected to the nervous system. In in the fleshiest sense, you know, our nervous system registers pain. It registers different responses in the body uh, on a physical level. 
So why would that not start from an energetic space? There's the mind outside the body. You're receiving an energetic package first and then the brain and the nervous system are going into whatever movement they do that they register as a, re- as a result of that. So this is actually evidenced in the fleshy aspect of us as well, that the mind is outside of the body in that regard. Yes, and that's why there's that teaching, well, ancient teaching that says you need to have an energetic boundary because you can't just take, take on everything, otherwise you're, you're, you're in the trying to discern an energetic soup. So when you understand your own space and the quality of that space, you can understand everything outside of it from the integrity that you hold yourself, and that's all part of the whole body-mindedness thing. But it's not about the nervous system, really. It's about energy, and it's about understanding that we are much more receptive and understanding of what's going on in the world energetically than we are with what's actually entered our body and, and gone through us as, as part of the receptivity that we are to deal with at any given time. Can you explain that a, a little bit more, just flesh it out? Yeah, so... What happens is we have, we have an interaction between us and that interaction between us is much more informing than what I will precipitate into me and make that understand or underst- uh, uh, comprehended by me if I use the system of emphasis based on what I receive by virtue of the intelligence that's only in the mind. Does that make sense? So if you're basing it just on the intelligence only in the mind, then you're limiting your ability to read. If I consider my mind to be only in my head, yes, and I have an interaction with you, I will convert everything that I have experienced with you into the limitations that I have made that to be under the understanding that that is where it's at, but it's actually not. That is only what I am. I have identified into the crust that I am trying to fit you into. Wow. Therefore, if I have pre preconceptions, if I have judgment, I will only precipitate you into that by virtue of not being able to understand you outside of that which I have made into my in, into my crust, into my mind, which is actually not inside of me. So what I'm saying is let go of all of that and understand each other from purely from an energetic point of view and therefore not project what I need to understand from you. Rather, I understand you by the energy that you are bringing out, rather than me converting it to what it needs to be inside the crust that I have created. What you're talking about is the prism of, and the prison of perception. So the perception, because by virtue of it being bound to time insofar as it's based on your prejudgments of a situation, it becomes a veil by which you, you can't actually see the, the depth and the richness of the energy that's in front of well, you. Well, what I'm actually doing is converting you all the time yeah. into, a, into a manner that I can understand you rather than, rather than putting myself into a situation where I should understand you openly and I should understand the richness that you come with, your flaws, your perfections, whatever that may be, all in one with no judgment. But if I start to convert you into what, how I need to interpret you, how I need you to fit in, then I will end up with judgment because I have to say, well, this part you're not good at and this part you are and this part you're better than me and this part I'm better than you. So I'm constantly converting rather than understanding you. So I'm not actually understanding you. I'm converting you into a package that I need you to be to fit in comfortably with how I need to perceive you so that it doesn't challenge me, or if it does challenge me, I'll have a reaction. That's the, that's the current model. What I'm saying is all we need to do is have an open understanding, an open interaction that is based on energy, and therefore I receive you by the openness that you are, without me converting what I'm receiving, rather understanding and being receptive to what is being shown to me without me having to do the converting. That's Does that make sense? Is yeah, absolutely, sense? because... When you, when, it's like when you're converting someone, it, you're, you're making them, you're scripting them into the narrative that you need to be the narrative that you're playing of how life is. So you're actually perverting the course of, of a transmission, an energetic transmission into a reality 
that that you need to, to perceive it to be. That's correct, and it's very uh, very um, limiting in terms of advancing each other. Because let's say, for example, you live a certain quality of love. So when you use the word love, you will come from that quality of love. I may not have that same quality. It may be a form of, let's say, um, just above physical abuse. So as long as I'm not physically abused, even though am I verbally or psychologically or emotionally abused, I will consider that love. So for love for me is not being bruised, not being cut, not being smashed, yeah, not being beaten. So you use the word love from the basis of understanding, say, multidimensional capacity where intimacy and transparency is greater than, than being human and you understand that, that a person's um, depth is much more than they are as a human being, let's say. So we start to have a conversation. Now, I won't understand your level of love if I stand here in a position where I can only convert what you say into the interpretation that I understand that word to be. But if I train myself to be open, if, I, if I'm schooled to be open, then by virtue of you communicating what you know love to be will take me out of the restriction I have in that word and elevate me, for want of a better word, out of the fact that, uh, that love is not simply absence of physical abuse and that there is far more to love. But if I don't and I put up a barrier and restrict you by, version, by virtue of the conversion, then I have to convert everything you say into the level of love that I hold. And because you are already not uh, indicating that there is physical abuse, I will go, oh, yes, yes, I know that love, but I really don't know that love. All I know is that I'm finding confirmation and agreement on the level that I've used from you to convert to the level of understanding that I need to fulfill my quota of restriction where there is no openness, when in fact there is no openness for us to expand each other because you're presenting to me a different level of love that will take me out of the restriction, but I'm converting it so that I'm not being elevated and therefore I control the fact and keep myself back. So really we, we need to work at softening the crust. We, we need to work at blowing apart that crust so that where there's the potential for us to be inspired by each other, where there's the potential for expansion, that opportunity can exist without the crust's interference. Yeah, let's do away with competition and comparison and jealousy. And so if I'm a person who only understands love at the level of non-physical brutality and you come along and say, say to me, well, this is my experience without putting me down or being critical, and you say, this is my experience of love, all my receptors should go up and say, wow, that's amazing. Uh, I'd like to experience that because you're not coming at me with critique or judgment and, and I myself have to play my part in terms of not comparing what I have or have not by virtue of what you are ex uh, sharing with me. And so that comes back to that openness that we were talking about earlier. So when there's no crust, there's an openness that allows me to instantly be, in this case, advanced by you sharing what you have come to, not because you're better but simply because you have been open to receiving that and therefore by virtue of sharing it with me, you're giving me the opportunity to be at one or in parallel to the quality of integrity you now understand love to be and for once upon a time for me was not possible beyond the restrictions that I have allowed it to be. What a beautiful science to advance each other. That's the process of communication and the process of communication is an openness and it should always be an openness. But the problem is with communication that we have in the world, there's always a filter of comparison. There's a filter of competition. And then there's the, and the angst of being right and wrong or you know, the, the time factors that come in. And whole body mindedness is an, is an openness that allows us to understand that everybody can access made many great things at any given moment. And if they do, we should be in the celebration of, it, of advancing each other not that you know more than I do. So if in this moment you, you access something that I don't know or something that is quite magnificent and advancing for all, 
I should not put myself in a situation where, oh, Rebecca got that and therefore she's smarter than me because that would be comparison and competition. I should say, wow, I've just been elevated to the same parallel because Rebecca is actually sharing, not demonstrating what she knows and doesn't know. That's super beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. The material in this video is based upon the principles of the Ageless Wisdom, which offers an energetic understanding of life. Any references to science are references to energetic science, as presented by the Ageless Wisdom, and not to evidence-based science in mankind's current era. Any references to specific aspects of medicine are to illustrate the relevance of energetic wisdom, as presented by the Ageless Wisdom, in the interplay of bodily illness and disease rather than contradicting the current theories of disease causation or in any way to replace epidemiology. The principles conveyed in this video are philosophical and religious and thus are not verified within the evidence-based rationales and critical appraisal process of evidence-based science, including Consort 2010, compliant double-blind randomized controlled trials. Serge Benhayen and Universal Medicine's presentations and teachings do not diagnose, treat, prevent, or offer any therapeutic cure to any disease or illness, are complementary to medicine, and are never a replacement of, or alternative to, conventional medicine. If you have any questions or concerns about the prevention, cause, diagnosis, or treatment of any disease or illness, you should consult a registered medical practitioner.